Hi, and welcome to my talk here at Digital GPSD. I want to talk about sliding and disjoint block estimators for the extremal index today. And I have to mention this is joint work with my PhD supervisor, Holger Dreh. Throughout this talk, I want to consider extreme value statistic for time series. And this is, if we observe a time series in, as in this picture here, we consider all observations as extreme, which are above the threshold, the red line here. This is the so-called peak over threshold setting. And I'm only interested in the behavior of the extremes. And the typical behavior which can be observed also in this picture here is that extremes don't occur singularly, but in clusters. There are groups of extreme observations and longer periods without any extreme. And there are some parameters which can capture or describe the dependence structure of these extremes, for example, the extremal index. And in this talk, I want to consider estimation methods with which we can estimate such parameters which describe the extreme dependence structure. And to start with, I want to introduce some general block-based estimators for extreme value statistics. And throughout this talk, we consider stationary time series X. This is demonstrated or illustrated here by the black line. And a typical form of an extreme value statistic now is a disjoint block statistic where we divide our time series in disjoint consecutive blocks, the blue blocks here, take from all these blocks only the extreme observations. This is only Xi's, which exceeds our threshold UN, and we standardize it again with our threshold. And on all of this extreme observation of one block, we apply some arbitrary function G and sum it up over all blocks. And then this has to be suitably standardized. But this way, we get a general extreme value statistic. There are many examples for such statistics, for example, for the extremogram, the spectral tail process, extremal index, or cluster indices, um, some older, some recent examples. But the nice thing about such block as additional block estimators is we understood them quite well since in the paper of Holger Dres and Holger Rutzen in 2010, there is a general framework for the asymptotic analysis of just such, such disjoint block extreme value statistics. So we understand the behavior of such statistics. Now we could ask ourselves, why should we use just this disjoint consecutive blocks what happens if we use so-called sliding blocks? Instead of starting the second block after the first one ended, we could take this first block, drop the first observation, add another, drop the first observation, add another, and so on. In this way, we can slide through our time series. This is now illustrated by the many more blocks here. And on the extremes of each of these blocks, we can again apply some general function G and sum it up over so many more blocks, and this way we get a general sliding block statistic. Of course, we have many more blocks, but two consecutive blocks now have a significant overlap. Only two observations differ, so there is also a much stronger dependence between them. It's a priori not clear whether this is an advantage way to define statistics. However, in the other extreme value theoretical approach, the block maximal approach, there are some examples, as here in Robert et al, Bücher and Segas, or Su et al, where sliding block estimators are more efficient than disjoint block statistics. And our question now is, in our peak over threshold setting, which is quite popular in literature, is there also the sliding block statistic more efficient? For the disjoint block statistic, we already know the asymptotic behavior due to the paper of Dres and Rutzen, but for the sliding block estimator, we have no analyze for the asymptotic behavior. So we have first to understand the behavior of the sliding block statistic before we can compare it with the disjoint block statistic. Okay, this is a quite general disjoint and sliding block statistic with some general function G. Before I introduce the limit set limit theorem, I want to show you some examples. It is an extremal index. The extremal index is quite popular to describe the heaviness of dependency in extremes of a time series. One over the extremal index is basically the mean cluster length of extremes. Under weak conditions, it can be defined by this limit, by the limit of this fraction where we have in the numerator the expected number of extreme observation and in the denominator the expected number of blocks which contain extreme observation. 
and dividing the number of extremes by the number of blocks, we get the mean cluster length or mean block length of extreme, therefore the interpretation of the extremal index. This index is quite popular to describe the dependency of extremes, and there are many estimators for this. One first estimator was introduced 30 years ago by and Xing as disjoint block estimator. And here we have an example for the general block statistic, the disjoint block statistic I showed you before, where we have an enumerator, a disjoint block statistic with block length Sn and block function G1, which is here just the indicator that we have one extreme observation. And in the denominator, we have a block length one and the block function G2 that this one observation is extreme. And this is, Choose an example for the general block statistic I showed you before here with two special functions, G1 and G2. And the behavior of this disjoint block estimator is well understood so far in the literature. Now also the sliding block version was proposed in literature where we have now some over the same block functional, some same block length in the numerator, but we start the second block in the second observation, the third block in the third observation and so on. This way we sum up over many more blocks and therefore we have to renormalize this with the factor one over Sn here in front. And it was suggested that the sliding block estimator is more efficient, but so far the asymptotic behavior of the sliding block statistic was never analyzed. And this is what we want to do with our general result in the next step. And therefore I want to first show you the general result for general sliding block statistics and therefore we consider an empirical process. Um, we still consider XNI as triangular array of row-wise stationary random variables. You can still think of XNI as the extreme standardized extremes observation of a time series. And we define a shortcut, the block starting in J of length as N by Y and J. And now we want to consider the empirical process of the estimation order of the sliding block statistic here in the middle which we centered with the expectation. If we have an unbiased statistics, this is just the estimation error, and we have to standardize this in a suitable way, which should the standardization should converge to infinity, but I don't want to go in detail here about this normalization. And for this empirical process, for not only one function G, but for a whole class of functions script G, um, we want to prove asymptotic normality of this estimation error. And this, of course, does not always so. We need some type of condition. And due to time constraints, constraints, I don't want to go into detail, but I only want to roughly sketch which type of conditions are needed. First, we need, of course, that generity. Then we need for some length, block length, and some artificial bigger block length, we need some weight conditions. We need some mixing condition, as typically if we consider time series, and we need second moment conditions, first for the cluster size of extremes and for some block, um, big blocks of sliding blocks. Um, second moments conditions are typical conditions if you want to achieve asymptotic normality in some way. And since we want to prove uniform convergence, we need also some measurability condition and entropy conditions. This could be bracketing entropy or covering entropy to achieve asymptotic tightness. These are standard conditions. And under such type of conditions, we now can prove asymptotic normality of our sliding block estimation error with the empirical process of the sliding block statistic converges weakly to a centered Gaussian process with covariance C, where C covariance is given from this condition C here. And so therefore we can now not only estimate, but with this limit result, we can state um, approximation bounds for the error of estimation. This does hold for general functions. Now we can analyze general extreme values, sliding block extreme value statistics. Um, now let's go back to the example of the extremal index. We call one over the extremal index is the mean cluster length of extremes. How many extreme observations occur at the same time in my time series? And we so the disjoint block statistic, which is well known, and also the sliding block statistic. And for the sliding block statistic, we now can state for the first time the asymptotic behavior. And we get that this sliding block statistics, the estimation of the sliding block statistic converges to a center 
normal distribution with this covariance here. And the somewhat surprising news here is the limiting covariance or variance is the same as for the disjoint block statistic. And there's also a third estimator for the extremal index, which is well known in the literature as the so-called ones estimator. And the ones estimator is a special sliding block estimator. And we can prove that also this ones estimator has the same limiting distribution as this block estimator. So here we have examples of disjoint and sliding block estimators, which all have the same limiting variance and therefore are equally efficient. This is only one example. In the beginning of this talk, we had the question, which estimator is more efficient, sliding or disjoint block estimator? And to answer this, I want to consider again the general statistic. Here again, I printed out them out again. Here's a sliding block sum and here's a disjoint block sum with some normalization in front. Since we have SN times many sum and compared to the disjoint case, we have in the sliding block case an additional normalization factor of SN. In front, the other normalization is the same. And by this normalization, both estimators have the same expectation and therefore basically the same bias. And so it's under, uh, for a comparison of both statistics, we can consider only the variances. And under suitable conditions, which are basically the same for both statistics, um, we can prove asymptotic normality now for both statistics for the sliding block with the result I showed you before. And then both statistics are asymptotic normal distributed and only the limiting variance differ. And the nice news under quite weak conditions, we need basically um, set generity, some technical condition, a weak better mixing condition. We can prove that the sliding block variance is less or equal to the disjoint block variance. This is the sliding block estimator is at least as efficient as the disjoint block estimator. And therefore, in the literature so far, mostly the disjoint case was considered and the sliding block estimator was sometimes stated, but never analyzed. Now we know we can analyze the sliding block statistic and we never lose if we switch to the sliding block version. However, to be fair, recently in the paper of Shifsoko and Kulik, it was shown for the large class of virtual varying time series for the large class of statistics of the cluster indexes one can show that the limiting variances are equal. So they are sliding and disjoint block estimators perform equally efficient in our peak over threshold setting. And with this, I want to come to an end. Here are some references I used during this talk. The blue line, blue reference is the paper on which this talk is based on. And then thank you for your attention.